Hello everybody, welcome back to the Ozone and welcome to the second story in the seventh Fazbear Frights book called The Cliffs. Oh my gosh, this one I am so excited for because I feel like it's going to be a really dark story based on the title. Uh, this is The Breaking Wheel. Um, so hopefully you enjoy this with me. Um, this is obviously a reaction as well to this story. I have never read this, so this is a reaction. Um, so yeah, we're, I'm going to experience it with you. So I think we should just go. We should just go straight ahead and start reading it, really. So this is The Breaking Wheel. I hate him, Reed whispered through gritted teeth. From across the aisle of desks, Shelley blew long dark bangs from her forehead, glanced at the back of Julius's head, and then rolled her eyes at Reed. Tell me something I don't know. Reed looked at her sideways. Just saying. Julius, as usual, had been bragging about his talents, and then he'd started complaining. Typical Julius. He was either telling everyone how he was better than they were, or he was trying to blame his problem on someone else. Too often, Reed had been on the, on the receiving end of that blame, along with the physical bullying that came with it. You need to ignore him, Shelley said. As if, Reed hissed. He's the big, he's the world, he's the world's biggest. <laughs> Did you have something to add to Julius's observations? Miss Billings asked Reed. Miss Billings was the perfect teacher for this class, small and compact. A plain face, generally devoid of emotion. The head of their robotics class moved in jerky, precise movements that had sparked more than one conversation about whether she was an advanced robot herself. Huh. Robotics class, you say, huh? The first week of class, Shelley's twin brother and Reed's other best friend, Pickle... Are you kidding me? Someone is called Pickle, okay. Had <laughs> has posited, Who's better to, who better to teach robotics than AI? Pickle was convinced Miss Billings was an android. For weeks, he'd been devising a plan to prove his hypothesis. Because so far, the plan involved cutting into Miss Billings, Shelley wouldn't let Pico Pickle go forward with it. So what was under the teacher's pale skin was still a mystery. Reed tipped his chair forward and sat up straight at his desk. In response to Miss Billings' question, he said, Um, no? Reed couldn't add to Julius's observations because he hadn't heard them. All he heard was Julius talked when the jerks loud, nasally twang. What? <laughs> uh, Julius never said anything you wanted to hear anyway. He only spoke in insults, complaints or brags. Miss Billings left her cool blue-eyed gaze on Reed long enough for him to start squirming before she shifted her attention back to the class as a whole. She flipped her long, wavy, blonde hair off her shoulder as she spoke. So let's talk about Julius's concern. What could Dilbert do to, present, to prevent his remote from affecting Julius's exosuit? Reed knew the class discussion was going to be a rehash of IR versus RF remotes, and since it had bored him the first time, he decided not to listen a second time. Besides, it wouldn't matter how much he listened. At this point in the semester, he knew he was going to crash and burn on his project in spite of whatever he learned or didn't learn. Reed looked at the midsize, partially constructed endos uh, exoskeleton sitting on his desk. He'd been working on it since Miss Billings assigned their spring semester product project, but it looked like he'd just started because he seemed to have missed too much pertinent information in the class lectures. He tried to use the textbook to help him fill in the blanks, but he didn't completely understand it. When Miss Billings had first introduced the concept of exoskeleton, she defined them as crude frames that could be attached to other things for added mobility. She then explained how that could be expanded upon if the frames, power sources, could add enough functionality to control the wearer. That's what had given him his great project idea. He'd intended to make something to fit over his little six sister Alexa's extremely annoying baby doll. He thought it would be cool to make the little doll scare his sister, a classic brotherly prank. But his vision at this point wasn't likely to become a reality. Shelley and Pickle had their projects over halfway done before Reed had gotten even a tenth of the way through his, and now they were both finished, a couple weeks 
before the project was due. Admittedly, Pickle's robot was puny, about the size of a small remote-controlled car, just a vaguely man-shaped small metal skeleton with not a lot of personality. Pickle's robot wasn't much to look at, but his robot had mad abilities. With his tricked-out custom remote, he could practically make the thing breakdance. Shelley's robot was similar, but dog-shaped instead of man-shaped. It was about the size of her Labrador. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher this name as well. Tally's, <laughs> I don't know, who was named after some man Shelley said was the first scientist. Oh, interesting. Uh, living between 624 BC and 545 BC, Tals of Miletus was an ancient Greek dude who did a lot of science and mathematics stuff. Look. I don't do Greek. <laughs> I don't. I can't speak Greek, okay? Reed could remember the guy's name and when he lived, but for some reason he couldn't remember anything Shelley had said the guy did. Not that any of that mattered. What mattered was that Shelley's robot was supposed to mimic a well behaved dog, and from what Reed could tell, she could probably win a dog show with the thing. She was going to get an A, like she always did. Why did he let the twins talk him into taking this class anyway? Sure, they were his best friends, but that didn't make him a science nerd like them. Reed was into computers, but not as related but not as they related to robot robotics, sorry. He wanted to combine his love for fiction with his aptitude for programming to become a game designer. He wasn't an engineer and he sucked at building things. Shelley and Pickle knew this. After all, Shelley was the one who couldn't let a year go without reminding him of his complete ineptitude. Uh, going all the way back to the building blocks they played with when they were ten years, uh, when 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 they eh, <laughs> when they were five years old. Sorry, I can't read. I am dyslexic. They were freshmen now. No, I'm not. They were freshmen now, and yet Shelley got the giggles at every science model and historical event diorama assigned to them. Every one of Reed's construction efforts reminded her of the log cabin five-year-old Reed had built, a cabin that looked less like a cabin and more like the aftermath of an explosion. But in spite of that good nature's ribbing, he knew Shelley hadn't talked him into this class just so, he could, just so she could laugh at him. And as for Pickle, he was too uninterested in others' shortcomings to orchestrate Reed's humiliation. It's fun when we take classes together. Shelley had said to Reed when he signed up. Pickle had grunted what could have been an agreement or non-committal disinterest. The truth was that Reed would do pretty much anything Shelley wanted him to do. They were friends and they'd been friends for too long for her to think of him as anything but a friend. But he spent more time than he'd ever admit thinking about what it would be if he and Shelley were more than friends. But after almost 10 years, the idea was still what his dad would call a castle in the sky. But maybe it wasn't. Sometimes when he talked to Shelley, she'd look at him with something like admiration, as if she was considering him in a different light. Take the cliché castle in the sky, for instance. One day when Reed Pickle and Shelley were getting off the bus, Shelley was talking about wanting something that was impossible. Reed had spotted clouds that looked exactly like a castle. He pointed at the castle-shaped clouds and said to Shelley, Look, a castle in the sky. That means impossible dreams can happen, even if it's in another dimension. He was just messing around, but Shelley said, Actually, you're right, and she squinted at him like he'd suddenly gotten interesting. Reed looked over at Shelley now, her attention on Miss Spillings. Uh, Sp Shelley was chewing on the ends of her thick black hair. She wore it in a meticulous, chin-length style which put the ends right at mouth level. She always chewed on her hair when she was concentrating. It was one of the few little imperfections he noticed about her. And just like all of her other imperfections, it was hopelessly charming. Nah, he didn't think Shelley and Pickle wanted him to humiliate himself for their amusement. That was mean, and they weren't mean. Maybe they were a little thoughtless sometimes because they'd get wrapped up in their books and their projects and forget to act like normal kids, but they weren't mean. Now, Julius, he was mean. Reed took a uh, Reed shot a dirty look at the artful blonde waves cascading down the back of Julius's head. Shelley once told Reed that Julius's hair was dreamy, even though she admitted his personality was somewhere between detestable and execrable. What does that mean? 
The latter word, among others, taught Reed to never again buy her a word of the day calendar for her birthday. Why does he have to use an RF remote? Julius whined to Miss Billings. I don't want his stupid remote to be telling my exo exoskeleton what to do. My ears, Reed thought. When Julius whined, his voice climbed an octave, and he sounded like a frightened weasel with a head cold. <laughs> who cared about the dreamy hair? Makes me gag, Reed thought. And who cared that Julius was tall and muscular, and shallow girls who rated boys on looks and or money instead of character thought he was a stud? Julius's voice told listeners everything they needed to know about him. He was a snivelling weasel who acted like an ass, so people wouldn't notice all that snivelling weaselness. All the expensive clothes Julius wore didn't cover his essential weasel identity either. No amount of skinny black jeans, gazillion dollar basketball shoes, designer shirts or cashmere scarves could disguise a true weasel. Reed looked at the dangling metal foot of Julius's gangly and exoskeleton, sorry I keep trying to say endoskeleton, which hung off the right size the right side of Julius's desk. You can tell I am a FNAF fan when I accidentally say endoskeleton when I read exoskeleton. <laughs> Julius's project was a skeletal suit he intended to wear, a collection of metal frameworks attached to mechanical joints at the shoulders, elbows, hips and knees. Julius's exosuit had leather straps and metal clamps that would hold the contraption in place on Julius's body. Spring, uh, spring lock suit? <laughs> He'd been bragging that it would make him even faster and stronger than he already was. Whatever. Reed thought exosuits looked a little like scaffolding. What a race of tiny people might create and attach to a human body so they could climb up and repair it. Reed wished Julius's Julius suit was scaffolding and there was a race of tiny people who could fix Julius, who was certainly in need of repair. Dilbert? Miss Bearding said. Pickle looked up. His real name was Dilbert, but his family and close friends called him Pickle. A play on Dill. Oh, okay, that, that makes sense now. <laughs> Can you explain to the class your reasoning for using an, F an RF remote? Sure, but I'm not just using an RF remote. I'm using the RF as an IR extender. I want my remote to be effective through walls, Pickle sniffled. I don't think the problem is my remote anyway. I've achieved my goal with my remote. If he hasn't achieved his goal, isn't it up to him to make adjustments? Why doesn't he? Pickle pointed at Julius. Install an RFI filter in his signal path, or he could change his frequency, or he could check his macros. He may have programmed them too close to mine. Pickle sniffled again. He didn't have a cold. He was just a perpetual sniffer. Short and dark like his twin sister. Pickle, unfortunately, didn't get his sister's looks. Shelley was pretty. Shelley was really pretty. It was just that no one other than Reed seemed to notice it because she was so intense. Or maybe it had to do with the baggy da button down shirts she always wore with her jeans. Pickle, on the other hand, would never be called pretty. With unusually deep set eyes and a nearly black unibrow, a long nose, and a strangely small mouth filled with crooked teeth, Pickle's looks weren't going to open doors for him. He was going to have to rely on his smarts to get him through life. Thankfully, he had plenty of those. Pickle narrowed his eyes at Julius to deliver the killing blow. He might, ha he might have even stolen my macros. I did not, Julius erupted. The sound came out as a cross between a honk and a screech. Miss Pillings uh, pushed a button on her own remote, a remote that controlled at least a dozen robotic creations in the room. Robotic arms attached to a monkey holding cymbals flung the cymbals out and smashed them back together. The metallic clang created a hush in the classroom. Julius crossed his arms and sulked, but he didn't whine anymore. Everyone else was still. After five seconds, Miss Billings said calmly in a flat, even tone, Dilbert makes excellent points, Julius. I suggest you attempt to implement some modification strategies of your own. Successful robotics aren't about getting others to make changes so your creation functions properly. We live in a world filled with RF signals. You're going to have to problem solve the issue using the techniques and knowledge you've learned in this class. Reed grinned at Julius's red ears. Smackdown. Ha! <laughs> Reed looked around the room to see if anyone else was enjoying Julius's embarrassment as much as he was. His gaze landed on... It's either Leah or Leah. I, I'm going to say Leah. 
uh, a curvy girl with uh, round eye, uh, with <laughs> round eyes, with round glasses, whom Reed had admired for much of the year. No one ever wanted to talk to her, but her happy demeanor and self confidence were unshakable. Leah noticed Reed. Reed's gaze and she winked at him. Whether or not the wink was shared enjoyment of Julius's discomfort was unclear, but Reed smiled at her anyway. The rest of the 15 kids in the class didn't look toward either Julius or Reed. They were all either fiddling with their projects or looking at Miss Billings' figures. This class wasn't exactly a cross-section of the normal freshmen, except for Julius, who was an odd combination of jock, brain, and bully. Everyone else in the room could have been running for Geek of the Year if there was such a contest. There were more glasses, bad haircuts and mismatched clothes in this room than the rest of the school combined. Robotics class might as well be called Misfits class. Now, Miss Billings said, if there are no other questions or complaints, no one said a word, no one moved. Good. Miss Billings stood and stepped over to the blackboard. Let's move on to a deeper discussion of actuators. I understand some of you are having problems there. So what are the four common types we talked about last week? Shelley's hand shot up. Reed suppressed a grin. Shelley had never met a question. She didn't want to answer. And for some reason, he always enjoyed seeing her small square hand with its bitten to the numb, to the nub fingernails stuck up in the air, vibrating with eagerness. Her excitement was audible through the, uh, the beaded bracelets she liked to wear. They clacked together while she waited for Miss Billings to call on her. Yes, Shelley? Electric motors, solenoids, hydraulic systems, and pneumatic systems. Excellent. When she wrote Shelley's answer on the blackboard with her right hand, Miss Billings pressed another button on the remote in her left hand. A small spider-shaped skeleton crawled up the inside wall of the classroom and struck, and stuck a light bulb-shaped sticker on the row next to Shelley's name which was on a huge chart that included all the class's names. Shelley had more stickers than anyone else. Reed had none. Reed turned away from the stupid chart and looked out at the window at the tiny pale green buds on the oak trees outside the school. He wondered if he could see the buds get bigger if he stared at them long enough. Watching trees grow had to be more interesting than this stuff. One of Miss Billings' robotic characters started marching up and down each row between the desks. The exoskeleton was vaguely shaped like a horse. Its hoof-like feet clapped against the grey linoleum floor as it pranced past Reed's dirty athletic shoes. Reed was pretty sure the robot was modelling an example of a hydraulic actuator. But maybe it was pneumatic. He sh probably should have been paying more attention. How did Miss Billing expect anyone to pay attention in this room full of animated characters, exoskeletons, and robotic parts? It was sensory overload, like having class in a circus. On top of that, even though Miss Billings wore conservative pantsuits, she obviously loved the colour red, which was splashed all over the school's institutional pale yellow walls in the form of huge posters and a uh, myriad of <laughs> charts. It was distracting. A wadded up piece of paper landed on Reed's desk next to his pathetic exoskeleton. He blinked and glanced at Miss Billings. She had her back to the class, so he spread out the paper. It was a note from Shelley. Coming home with us? Long homework session, followed by a smiley face. Shelley thought home lo long homework sessions were fun. He looked at Shelley. She was mo watching Miss Billings, but she nodded when Reed gave her a thumbs up. Not that he wanted to do homework but he did want to go home with friends, and besides, he had to do homework. At least, when he studied with Shelley and Pickle, he got better grades. As soon as Miss Billings dismissed the class, Pickle grabbed his robot and jumped up. He did this every day because, he was the, because this was the last class before lunch. Pickle loved to eat. That was the only other thing he had going for him. Pickle ate more than Shelley and Reed combined, and he didn't have much more meat on him than his metal skeletal robot did. The boy had the metabolism of a hummingbird. Today, Pickle was in an even bigger hurry. Today was a half day because all the teachers had some conference to go to. After school activities had been cancelled, there would be no late buses. The principal had announced that, th that morning that the school would be closed up and locked at noon. This meant Pickle and, of course, Shelley and Reed were in for an afternoon of the great snacks Mrs. Gerard put out for the twins and their little brother, 
Ori on special days like this. There's so many characters, oh my god. It's hard to keep up. Even on normal days, stuff like homemade pizzas, veggie egg rolls and grilled sandwiches were typical after school eats at the Girard house. But on special days, Miss Girard went over the top. Pickle, Shelley and their little brother, Ori, were beyond lucky. Their mum was home to make them hot food in the afternoon and then another great meal later on in the afternoon, in the evening, sorry. Uh, reading... <laughs> Reed was lucky if he could scourge up a few pretzels when he had to go home to his empty house. Luckily, he usually got to home with the twins. If he didn't, he'd, been, he'd have been even skinnier than he was. Pickle started trotting up the aisle toward the door as Reed picked up his project and tried to figure out how to shove it into his backpack. He didn't take his eyes off of Pickle as he folded and refolded the project's robotic arms. So, he saw when Julius stuck out his foot and trapped pickle, and tripped pickle, sorry. Oh my gosh, I'm stumbling on so many words, I'm very sorry, I do this a lot. Just please give me some sympathy? <laughs> I don't know what the word is. I'm not very good with words, as you can tell. Pickle, who wasn't the most coordinated kid anyway, lost his balance and flew, toward, and flew forward into the desk in front of Julius. Pickles is Big nose led the way wherever his face went, so his nose took the brunt of the impact when it hit the corner of the desk. Blood spurted from Pickle's nostrils as Julia snorted out a high-pitched laugh. Miss Billings, who had been gathering a stack of books and preparing to leave the room, didn't see a thing. Neither did anyone else. Everyone was too focused on where they were going. Even Shelley had her head down as she collapsed her dog-sized exoskeleton into a puppy-sized one. This was a particularly clever part of her project, Reed thought. She'd told him if she could figure out how to downsize that name to <laughs> Tully's to without hurting him, of course. She'd patent collapsible dogs and become a billionaire. Reed's muscles bunched as he watched his friend try to stop the spurting blood with one hand. Reed wanted to help Pickle and he wanted to confront uh, Julius, but he knew where it would lead if he put himself in the middle. As if reading Reed's mind, <laughs> that's a hard <laughs> sentence to say, Julius turned and smiled. Julius's unusually pointed canine teeth seemed to gleam under the classroom's fluorescent lighting. Not for the first time, Reed fantasized that Julius was a vampire who could be vaporized by the stake through the heart. If Julius had a heart, Reed clenched his fists as Pickle ran from the room clutching his robot with one hand and his bloody nose with the other. Before Reed could tell Shelley what had just happened, she got her act together and hurried after Pickle, calling, Pickle, wait up. Julius gave Reed the evil eye for another few seconds, then he turned to gather up his floppy exoskeleton. All the other kids filed out of the room. Reed lingered. He wanted to say something to Julius. What was it Shelley had called Julius the other day, when they were talking about him? Oh yeah, she'd said he was an ignominious, odious reprobate. <laughs> Reed mentally repeated the words. They sounded ridiculous. Only Shelley could get away with saying something like that. Yeah, you definitely wouldn't see me saying that again. What are you staring at? Julius asked Reed. Reed looked around. He realised he and Julius were alone in the room. He hated that his palms had started sweating and his breathing was coming faster. Why did he let Julius get to him? Julius stopped trying to gather up his suit. Instead, he carefully laid it out. He grinned at Reed. Bet you wish you could build something like this, huh, moron? Reed didn't answer. He wanted to pick up his backpack and leave, but something kept him in the room. What? He didn't know. It sure wasn't the company, which sucked. It wasn't the decor, which he found intimidating, and it wasn't the smell, which was a cross between chalk and soldering. I don't know what you're doing in this class, Julius sneered. I mean, your runty little friend may be a mini freak, but at least he has a few brain cells. And your other friend, that weird hair-chewing chick, is an uppity cow. But with a little makeup, she wouldn't be too bad to look at. And she has brain cells too. You've got nothing going for you. You are a freak and nothing can make you worth looking at. And on top of that, you're all air up there, aren't you? Julius leaned forward and flicked a finger between Reed's eyes. Reed tightened his fists, and Julius noticed. What are you going to do? Hit me. 
Didn't you see what I did to your pickled friend? Julius laughed his beyond annoying laugh. Uh, laugh. <laughs> I didn't even have to lift a finger. I just moved my foot and now he has a bloody nose. Just think of what I could do to you without giving it much effort. Reed swallowed. Julius had just called Reed an ugly, stupid freak. And yet, Reed was still standing there as if he couldn't talk. Reed hated being called a freak, and he hated being called ugly. Yeah, Reed was a bit of an outcast. When his mum had died, he hadn't seen the point in trying to get along with anyone. He'd separated himself from his friends, using his overwhelming grief as the fence to erect a barrier between himself and the world. Only Pickle and Shelley had bothered to climb the fence. And no, Reed wasn't much to look at. The truth was, he was not unlike Pickle in the looks department. Skinny with unusually long arms, his pronounced brow ridge and jutting jaw gave him more of an ape-like appearance than he wanted to admit. More than once, Julius called him monkey face when he was younger. Now that his dad let him grow his curly brown hair long, he was able to disguise his pri primate figures, uh, features a little. Wow. If only he had an ape's strength. <laughs> he still wanted to say something to Julius. No, forget saying anything. He wanted to do something, but he couldn't. Why did he think things would be any different in high school than they had been in grade school? Julius lifted his exoskeleton. See this here? I was going to use it to be stronger and faster, but I don't need to be stronger and faster. I'm already strong and fast. I've figured out a better use. I'm going to get this thing working perfectly, and then I'm going to hold you down and put you into it. Then, I'll control the exoskeleton and make it, um, and it will make you do whatever I command it to do. You'll have to be my servant. I'm going to make you wait on me all day long. You'll carry my books, tie my shoes, get me food, clean up after me. I'm even going to make you dance for me. Ah! Oh no! What? Okay, that's so weird. Sorry, I, 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 I obviously screamed really loudly there. I'm really sorry if that was, like, too loud for you. What? That line, that line is suspicious. I'm even going to make you dance for me? Oh. Because so far we haven't had a connection um, between the stories with dance with me. Dance for me. Oh, no, yeah, no, it is dance. It's dance with me, isn't it? Ah. Oh. Maybe, maybe that's not, maybe that's nothing. Never mind. I don't know. It, uh, tell me guys in the comments if you think that's anything. But that, that was very suspicious when I, re re when I read it. What do you think about that, loser? Would you like to dance like a monkey for me? Reed still didn't speak. It was like he'd been turned to stone. All he could do was stand there and watch Julius lean over and tinker with his exoskeleton. Julius looked up and laughed at Reed. Cat got your tongue. Julius lifted up his exoskeleton suit. Want to see it in action? It's pretty amazing if I do say so myself. Julius began fitting the suit to his long limbs and V-shaped torso. The metal shell lay over Julius's limbs, a shoulder strap, chest strap and, his, and hip strap along with clamps in the wrists and ankles kept everything in place. Reed, biting the inside of his cheek hard enough to draw blood, remained rooted to the spot, watching. Outside the classroom, students laughed and called to each other as they headed to the buses lined up outside the school. Inside the classroom, it was nearly silent except for the clicks and snaps of Julius fitting himself into the robotic skeleton. See here? Julius held up his arms. He indicated his wrists, then pointed to his ankles. I've equipped the exoskeleton with locking me mechanisms, so once I can get you in it, I can keep you in it. Reed watched Julius struggle with some of the joints of his exoskeleton. Julius shifted his, the framework on his body, then adjusted the suit's piston cylinders. Outside, a couple buses started their engines and a baritone rumbling vibrated the walls of the school. If Reed didn't leave soon, he'd have to walk to the Girard's house. He'd have to walk over seven miles, all because he'd stood here like a paralysed mute for the last several minutes. He shook his head and to try and get his brain rebooted. Julius, heavy with the exoskeleton riding his body, leaned down and fiddled with the wires um, leading to the skeleton circuits. Reed wished he had the guts to reach out and shove Julius across the room, him and his stupid exoskeleton. But it was a good thing he didn't. A second later, Reed was glad he wasn't touching Julius. A radiant flash burst up like fireworks as a power surge sparked in the, endoskele in the exoskeleton. Julius's body twitched, his eyes widened, and he went rigid for several seconds. In those seconds, Reed's mind bizarrely thought of the previous day's word of the day. 
Shelley, sta- uh, Shelley shared every one of them with him. He forgot most of them, but he remembered f- fulgurant, which means flashing like lightning. That power surge was fulgurant, he thought, with curiosity for what he was going to hap- for with curiosity for what was going to happen next. Reed watched the stiffness leave Julius's body. Julius wavered, 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 <laughs> wavered on his feet, lost his balance, um, and fell back on his desk. Shaking his head, he groped for his chair and slid into it. He put his head down, and for what felt like a long twenty seconds, Julius was perfectly still. Was he alive? Reed blinked and studied Julius's inert form, then Reed's gaze landed on the wrist and ankle joints of the suit. Finally, Reed moved. Stepping over to Julius, Reed quickly locked the wrist and ankle joints. They fitted together with a satisfying snick. As soon as they did, Reed stepped back and grinned. That would, che- that, that would teach the ignominious, odious reprobate. Oh, I said before I would never say that again. I was so wrong. <laughs> Reed picked up his backpack and slung it over his shoulder. He watched as Julius opened his eyes. It took a second for him to get orientated, or oriented, but when he did, he attempted to strip off the exoskeleton. Oops, Reed said. He backed toward the classroom door. He finally found his voice. I must have locked you in. My bad. Julius jerked his arms, yanking to free them from the restraints of his skeletal suit. He kicked his legs. With his right hand, he grabbed at the exoskeleton, hugging his left hand. He grunted and strained. The skeleton wouldn't budge. What the hell do you do to me, punk? Julius yelled. Unlock me. I don't think so, Reed said. Do what I tell you. Unlock me. Julius's face was a mottled mix of red and purple, and his eyes looked like they were bulging out of his head. Spittle clung to the corners of his mouth. Reed shrugged and grinned. He couldn't remember the last time he was this pleased with himself. Not that he'd thought that. Not that he'd thought through what he ju- he was doing. What was the point of what he'd just done? Was he just messing with Julius? Was he was he going to leave Julius in the suit overnight? Could he do that? Why not? He'd get in trouble. He'd get in trouble. Was why not? What? <laughs> Is it just me, or does that sentence just not make sense? He'd get in trouble. Was why not? I don't know. Julius would tell the teachers what Reed did. But all Reed would have to do was deny it. If he made sure Julius was lock- unlocked by morning, why would anyone suspect Reed of anything? Everyone knew he was pretty much a wuss. No one would believe he had the courage to do this. Unlock me, Julius commanded again. The muscles in his neck stood out like cords. His jaw jutted, and he kept opening and closing his fists. At this point, Reed really had no choice but to leave Julius here all night. If he let Julius out now, Julius was going to beat the crap out of him. Even if he unlocked Julius and ran, Reed probably wouldn't outrun the guy. Julius was pretty fast, and Reed was an athletic spaz. (laughs) If he waited until morning, there would be enough people around that Julius wouldn't touch him. The decision basically made itself. Julius was going to be locked in overnight. The idea buoyed Reed so much, he felt like he was floating. I'm going to do you a favour, Reed said, happy that he had something clever to say. I'm going to leave you here in your suit overnight so you can get an idea of what it feels like to have someone treat you the way you treat everyone else. Maybe your robot can teach you a thing or two. Hey, Julius tried to get up, but his exoskeleton was contracted and stiff. It was acting like a full body cast, keeping Julius's body locked in a seated position. Have fun, Reed called as he sprinted from the room. Before he left the classroom, he shut off the lights. Get back here, you stupid ape, Julius screamed. Do you know what I, do you know, uh, do you know what you've done? I'm going to kill you. The last few words came out, a nearly unintelligible (laughs) screech, as Reed pulled the door closed. I I did that for irony, I definitely did that on purpose. Uh, Julius began bellowing. I'm going to rip your head off and flush it down the toilet. I'm going to tear you apart limb from limb. Get back in here and unlock this. Reed laughed. For some reason, Julius's threat, which normally would have reduced Reed to quivering jelly, sounded funny. For once, Julius had no power. Reed had it all. Reed looked around the empty hallway. He was alone. Good. The whole wing was. This whole wing was probably empty by now. As an auxiliary hall near the back of the school, it wasn't used. It, it wasn't used outside of class hours. No one would find Julius, even if he yelled his head off. Come back here and let me out of this thing, Julius screamed. You can't leave me in here like this. Reed grinned. 
Then he turned and ran through the school, hoping he wasn't too late to catch his bus. Because Mr. Jansen, the bus driver, was always looking out for him, Reed didn't miss the bus. He made a total fool of himself, waving his arms around and shouting as Mr. Jansen started to pull away from the curb, but he got the driver's attention. Mr. Jansen stopped the bus a few feet from the curb and opened the bus's doors. The driver of one of the buses further down the row behind Reed's bus honked. Stumbling up the stairs onto the bus, Reed gasped, thanks to Mrs. Mr. Gan Ganson, <laughs> who shook his grey head, head and winked at Reed. Cutting it close, my boy, cutting it close. Reed sucked in some air. Sorry. Life happens, Mr. Jansen said. We adjust. He smiled at Reed. Take your seat. Reed scanned the interior of the bus. One of the cheerleaders gave him a disgusted look. Reed ignored her and looked for Shaddy and Prickle. He knew they'd be at the back of the bus, and he knew they'd saved him a seat. Keeping his gaze on his feet and the aisles scuffed rubber flooring, Reed hurried to his friends. He slid in next to Pickle. As soon as Reed's butt hit the hard maroon vinyl seat, Mr. Jansen released the brakes. The bus hissed, lurched, and rumbled away from the school. Reed looked at Pickle's nose. It was hard not to, red and swollen, smeared with blood. Pickle's nose was more prominent than ever, and now he had little white tissues, tissue rolls sticking out of each nostril. Given that his nose was beaky, Pickle looked like a big bird sucking up white worms. Does it hurt? Reed asked. Pickle, as usual, was doing some kind of numbers puzzle. He glanced up at Reed. Huh? Reed pointed at his nose. Pickle made a funny cross-eyed face in an attempt to look at his injured beak. Reed suppressed a smile. Pickle shrugged. Yeah, not the first time though. I can ignore it. Sorry. Why? What did you do? Nothing. Pickle returned to his puzzle. Reed glanced at Shelley. She was also reading, as usual. Um, the bus smelled like diesel exhaust, sweat, peanuts and bubblegum. Its engine sounded like the contented snore of a sleep sleeping dragon. Uh, the sound helped tension and adrenaline drain from Reed's system. The bus gained speed as it turned out of the school's driveway onto the road. Reed looked out the window. The high school was tucked into the back of an older neighbourhood, so the first few blocks after they left the school were full of big trees and pretty green lawns. Reed usually liked looking at all that greenery. He would stare at the lawns with envy. His front yard was mostly dirt. Today, Reed wasn't really seeing anything he was looking at. He was back in the robotics classroom with Julius. His mind focused on Julius locked into his exoskeleton, Julius's face nearly purple with rage. In the Dark Ages, Shelley said, Harsh torture was commonly used to punish those who broke the law. Reed flinched. What? He turned to stare at Shelley. As always, she sat in the seat behind Pickle and Reed. Her massive backpack and extra book bag took up the rest of the seat. Did she know what he'd done? Her attention on her book, Shelley continued. When someone violated civil war, torture would be done in the town square. Public display of the consequences for lawlessness was thought to be a deterrent. Oh, she was reading. Of course she was. She loved to share what she was learning, and she often read it aloud on the bus, and at home, and at lunch, and in the hallways, and at school. She read pretty much everywhere. Today she was reading her history homework. Shelley was in AP World History because she'd read so many history books outside of school that she was beyond the normal history curriculum. She wasn't just a, shy, a science geek. She was an information geek. Reed relaxed his shoulders and returned his attention to the window. When it left behind the neighbourhood, the, the bus route ran along a main drag lined with strip malls and car dealerships. Reed liked this stretch too because he enjoyed looking at the cars. He liked to imagine himself driving them and he picked a different make and model every day. Concentrating, he put himself at the wheel of a new bright yellow Mustang. Shelley's voice, however, ruined his fantasy. Torturers were very creative in the Middle Ages, Shelley read. They came up with truly morbid ways of inflicting excruciating pain. The Judas Cradle, for example, impaled a seated victim for several days, with blood-curdling names like the Breast Ripper and the Pair of Anguish. Medieval torture devices were a testament to human ingenuity. Torture. 
What's, what's what I did to Julius torture? Reed's chest tightened. Yeah, it probably was. Being stuck was at least a mild form of torture, especially in an exoskeleton with no way to move or eat or drink or get to the bathroom. It wasn't the Judas Cradle, but it wasn't nice either. After the mauls and Carlots, their bust route wound uh, through a uh, wound, sorry, through an industrial park, and then it passed a farm before turning into a newer subdivision. Most of the bus's stops were in this subdivision, which was stuffed full of houses that, though good size, mostly looked alike. Reed didn't care about the houses, so he stopped registering individual things. Now he just saw blurs of colour and Julia stuck in that metal framework. Reed's dad, who did the best he could to be a single dad to Reed and his sister Alexa, was fond of saying that you couldn't solve a problem at the level of the problem. Reed wasn't a genius like his friends, but he was smart enough to know that meant lowering himself to the level of Julius's meanness wasn't the way to handle the jerk. But still, after what Julius did to Pickle, wasn't that justification enough to lock Julius in the, into the exoskeleton he was so proud of? And what about what Julius had said to Reed about locking Reed in, into the exoskeleton? Didn't Julius deserve to get a taste of his own medicine? Reed started to unwind his muscles again. Yeah, what he did wasn't so bad. It was justice. The bus went through a pothole and everyone popped off and everyone popped up off their seats for a nanosecond. When they all landed again, Shelley poked Reed's shoulder. He turned to look at her. Listen to this, she said. You won't believe it. What? Pickle said nothing. He kept inking in the answers to his puzzle. One of the most commonly used forms of torture was called the wheel, Shelley read from her thick, musty-smelling book. Those condemned to being constrained in this way had prolonged torture ahead of them. They were held in place, unable to free themselves. Reed stared at Shelley. What was she doing? Was she messing with him? Held in place, unable to free themselves. It sounded like she was talking about Julius. Maybe she knew what he'd done after all. But how? It was, some kind, it was sometimes called the breaking wheel, Shelley read on. Reed blew out air. No. She didn't know that, but she didn't know what she, he'd done. It was just a coincidence that she was reading about torture devices. They called it that, she continued, because it was used to crush the bones of the condemned. Ooh, huh? Shelley looked at Reed with wide eyes. Then she returned her gaze to the book and read on. The device was designed for torture lasting over multiple days. The wheel was made up of many radial spokes and the person subjected to it was tied to the whole wheel before a club or Cudgel, cudgel was used to beat their limbs. This process reduced the human being into a mutilated bag of bones, sorry, what one onlooker described as a writhing, moaning monster with bloody tentacles. That's gross, Pickle said, without looking up from his puzzle. Totally, Reed said. He tried not to think about what Julius was experiencing now. But hey, at least Julius wasn't tied to a medieval torture device, right? Julius was, rest uh, was restrained, and as time passed, he'd be uncomfortable. But he wasn't in any pain. No one was standing over and beating him with a cudgel or whatever that was. He was just trapped. Shelley continued to read about medieval torture, but Reed tuned her out. He turned back toward the window. The bus was stopped at a corner, and he watched her mum holding hands with a little balloon with a little kid who held a red balloon, sorry. The balloon bobbed in the air, following the little kid's movements because it was tied to the kid's wrist. Reed thought about Julius's big wrists. Maybe he should go back to the school and unlock the exoskeleton after their study session this evening. A few hours would be enough to punish Julius for his, ha uh, for his nattiness. That way Julius would learn his lesson, but Reed wouldn't stoop to the level of torture. Yeah, that's what Reed would do. Except, how would he get away from Julius before Julius tried to kill him? Reed chewed on his lower lip. He sat up straight and smiled. He knew what he could do. He'd unlock just one of Julius's hands and then jump back and run before Julius could grab him. Julius, stiff from his confinement, would take at least half a minute to unlock his other wrist and his ankles and in that time, Reed could get far enough away to hide. Once Julius was done, Reed could go home. And after that? Well, he'd deal with that when the time came. But until then, he was going to have some good food at the Girard's house and hang out with his friends. He was going to put Julius out of his mind and enjoy the rest of his free time that day. He deserved it. 
just like Julius deserved what was happening to him. Reed loved his dad, and he knew his dad did everything he could to give Reed and Alexa a good home, but his dad was, well, his dad. He knew nothing about what a good home was. He couldn't cook, he couldn't clean. He thought decoration was a calendar with fish photos on it and a few sports team schedules. When Reed was home, he never really felt at home, not like he did here at the Girard house. Reed sprawled on a thick, soft grey rug in front of a stone hearth. A low burning fire sputtered on the grate. T oh god. <laughs> Tallies. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to call them tallies, whatever. Uh, exhausted from a rousing game of chase the tennis ball, was now stretched out on the cool tiles of the nearby entryway, adding his satisfied snores to the flames' staccato popping. The sounds were both rhythmic and soothing. Reed's belly was full of spicy chicken wings, jalapeno poppers, potato skins, homemade pot pie, and chocolate cookies. He was so relaxed he wished he could take a nap. You kids have everything you need before I head to my class? Mrs. Gerard asked. She stood in the archway between the family room and the entryway, tugging on a floppy yellow rain hat. Reed turned and looked over his shoulder, out through the French doors to the Gerard's heavy treed backyard. Yep, it was raining. A steady but light spring rain. The drops looked shiny and pink in the twilight. Reed craned his neck to see the western horizon. He liked looking at the sun when it was getting ready to slide into nighttime. Tonight the sun was a fuzzy bright orange tinged with purple. He looked back at Mrs. Gerard. Thanks for the snacks and for the dinner too. Mrs. Gerard smiled and tucked her shoulder length dark hair under the rain hat. She shrugged her short plump body into her slicker and said, you're welcome as always Reed, we love having you here. She snapped her slicker closed and looked at her own kids who were all oblivious of her impending departure. Shelley, reclining on an overstuffed navy blue sofa, had her nose buried in the same thick history book she'd been reading on the bus. Pickle sat cross-legged in his dad's blue tweed recliner, bending so low over his own book it looked like he was trying to dive into it. Reed couldn't see what Pickle was reading. The third Gerard kid, six-year-old Ori, had been playing a video game but now he was picking up the remote for Pickle's robot skeleton. <clears throat> Kids, Mrs. Gerard yelled. All three of her children looked up. Mrs. Gerard shook her head and smiled. I'm leaving. You kids behave. And Pickle, I start nose again in an hour or so. Huh? Pickle said. Mrs. Gerard shook her head. I'll remind him, Reed said. Pickle's nose was looking much better. Predictably, Mrs. Gerard had matter-of-factly treated uh, Pickle's nose the second they got home. Ex examining it, she would declared it bruised, not broken, and she'd cleaned it up, applied some kind of herbal cream, and then given Pickle an ice pack to balance on his face. Pickle resided that, because he couldn't eat or read with the pack on his nose, but he didn't have to leave it on for long. Soon, he was eating snacks along with everyone else, and he declared the double chocolate chip cookies Mrs. Gerard brought out after dinner healing cookies because his nose stopped hurting after he ate them. Now, after studying her beaky son for a second, Mrs. Gerard looked at Reed. What would we do without you, Reed? Mrs. Gerard smiled at him and then turned back to her kids. Bye, kids. Love you, mum, Shelley said. Bye, Pickle and Ori said in unison. Thanks again, Mrs. Gerard. Bye. Reed said, bye all, Mrs. Gerard said, come on Tallies. <laughs> Tallies was already on his feet, standing next to Mrs. Gerard's legs. His tail whipped so fast it was slapping her in the thigh. Mrs. Gerard's class was his class too. He was learning to be a therapy dog. Mrs. Gerard, though not the source of her children's brilliance, was no brain slouch. She went to all sorts of classes. She seemed to have a lot of interests, and she always joined in the conversations when her kids were babbling on about their homework or projects. But the Gerard brains come mostly from Mr. Gerard. He was a retired electrical engineer who now did consulting for big companies. He travelled a lot, and he was gone now. But when he was here, he was a hands-on dad. He was cool. 
Shelley and Pickle had returned to their books before the front door shut behind Mrs. Gerard. Ori pressed a button on the remote control and Pickle's robot skeleton stood up and slid forward a few inches. Ori's eyes lit up. Ori was a conglomeration, conglomeration of his siblings, which made him not as cute as Shelley, but much cuter than Pickle. His face was still round and a little pudgy. Ori had Shelley's large eyes and long lashes and full mouth, and he had his brother's nose. On Ori, the big nose was more amusing than ugly. He looked like, a little like a baby bird. Six-year-olds could rock a look like that. Ori wouldn't have to worry about looks for a while. Ori bent over the remote, so intent on it, he nearly touched it with his long nose. The little robot skeleton scooted to forward some more. Ori laughed. Reed glanced at Pickle. Pickle either didn't know his brother was playing with his project or he didn't care. Probably if Ori damaged the thing in any way, Pickle could easily fix it. Reed looked at his own pathetic project. He was supposed to be working on it, and he hadn't and he had been sort of on and off all, all afternoon. Um sorry. He hadn't made much progress though. Reed had chosen an electric motor as his actuator because his dad knew how to build a motor and was excited to help him. That part of the project, along with connecting the battery-powered motor to the exoskeleton circuitry, had gone okay. The problem Reed had now was with the skeleton structure. As always, he couldn't visualise how to construct the form. Every time he attached a new metal component to the skeleton, he ended up with something that stuck out at an unnatural angle. And when he turned to make it fit, the joint didn't work properly. Right now, his exoskeleton looked mangled and backwards. This wasn't good. Reed sighed and gazed around the cosy room. Even though the Gerard family room was big and had high ceilings, it was warm and inviting, kind of like a cocoon. Filled with comfortable, soft furniture, a couple tables, multiple shelves, stuffed with books and games, colourful art, a tidy play area for Ori, a big microfiber covered bed for tallies, the fireplace, and a huge TV for movie night and video games. The room was perfect for hanging out. It wasn't so bad for doing homework either. You might as well be comfortable while you were doing something you didn't want to do. The week before, the family room got an addition that intrigued Reed. It was a miniature house, a replica of the Girard home. Standing about three feet tall and stretching four, re four feet wide, the house required the removal of one ottoman from the room. But otherwise, it fit in just fine. Mr. Girard built the house for Shelley, and she was decorating it to look exactly like the family's real house. Do you want me to help you with that? Pickle asked. Huh? Reed looked over at his friend. Pickle marked his book which Reed could now see was on advanced engineering mathematics. You sighed, Pickle said, and your exoskeleton looks like it's being built by a blind man without opposable thumbs. I wondered if you wanted some help. Reed threw a gear at Pickle. Pickle didn't mean to be mean, but he was brilliant. He was just brilliant in his own matter-of-fact kind of way. That was why he was okay to hang out with, even though he was super smart. Pickle never made Reed feel dumb. Even when he made a comment like that one. Reed knew Pickle wasn't making fun of him. Pickle was just making an observation. I'll model through, thank you. You might try angling the joints so the left and the right limbs move in the same or at least similar ways. Unless you're building an alien uh, exoskeleton. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Obvious, Reed said. He made a face. Maybe I am building an alien exoskeleton. Cool. Pickle shrugged and returned to his book. Shelley looked up from hers. What? Reed laughed. My exoskeleton is an alien. Shelley rolled her eyes and returned to reading. Ori laughed. Reed turned to see if the kid was laughing at Reed. He wasn't. What? <laughs> you put Reed in the same sentence. He was fully focused on the robot's remote. Pickle's robotic skeleton ploughed into the hearth with a loud crunch. Pickle didn't look up from his book. Ori, tried, or, or he backed up the seven-inch skeleton and started spinning it in a circle. Reed began to reconsider Pickle's offer. He was pretty sure Pickle had built his little robotic skeleton in a day. Maybe he could help Reed salvage his project. Seriously, look at the thing move, Reed thought. He shook his head at the little robotic skeleton as it whipped in tight circles. He sucked in his breath and sat up. How could he have forgotten what happened in class today? 
Well, to be fair, a lot had happened since class. The confrontation with Julius, along with Reed's resulting uncharacteristic burst of nerd, of nerd, of nerve, had pretty much acted like a brain wipe of the rest of the day. All Reed could think about was Julius locked in his exoskeleton. But now he remembered. Julius all Julius had been complaining that Pickle's remote was affecting Julius's exoskeleton, and Julius was now locked into that metal frame, his body inextricably linked <laughs> with its structure and therefore inextricably linked with its movement. What if it had crashed into something the way Pickle's robot had just crashed into the hearth? What if it was spinning in circles right now? Hey, Pickle. Reed kept his gaze on the gyrating mini metal skeleton. Huh? Pickle looked up at Reed. That thing, Reed pointed at the remote in Ori's small hands, doesn't have much of a range, right? Pickle sniffed. It's a pretty great range actually. I designed the remote to function through walls. That's why I combined IR and RF. So if it was controlling um, something uh, outside the house, how far would its range be? Reed asked. Pickle frowned. You mean if the skeleton was outside and Ori was inside? Reed nodded. Yeah, sure that's what he meant. He didn't mean if the remote was controlling Julius's exoskeleton. No, he didn't mean that at all. Pickle tilted his head and thought about it. It might reach to a few feet outside the house, maybe. Honestly, I've never checked. It probably doesn't reach beyond the house. The outer walls would be thicker than the inside walls. More interference. Oh, Reed said attempting to sound uninterested even though he had asked the question. Okay. Reed tugged at his t-shirt, which was sticking to his suddenly sweaty skin. He suppressed a sigh of relief. Pickle leaned forward. Why'd you ask? Ori now had the robotic skeleton racing through the room in dizzying, in dizzying serpentine roots around furniture. Reed tried not to imagine Julius zipping around the robotics classroom in a similar fashion. If he was doing if he was doing in his suit what Pickle's robot was doing here, Julius would be bashed into walls and furniture. He'd be at least badly bruised. More likely he'd have broken bones. Oh man, Reed thought. I must be truly torturing Julius. Reed? Reed looked at Pickle. He was suddenly elated that his friend's genius didn't extend to reading minds, and he was also glad that Pickle also sucked at deciphering facial expressions, body language, and other social cues. Reed was sure his deliberately blank face wasn't as effective as he wanted it to be. He was trying for innocent, but he had a feeling he looked like Tally's did when when the dog stole, stole a cookie and was pretending and was trying to pretend he didn't. Oh, I was just curious, Reed said. It's impressive, that's all. Pickle raised a thick black eyebrow. Okay. Pickle might not have been able to read interpersonal visual cues, but his brain was like an audio recorder. He remembered everything he'd ever read or heard. He was now going through that database and contrasting everything Reed had ever said to him before today with what Reed had just said. Reed had never before told Pickle that he'd, something he'd done was impressive, he was so used to Pickle outperforming everyone around him that praising Pickle for doing something well was sort of like praising him for breathing. Pickle definitely found Reed's last comment strange. Pickle opened his mouth as if he was going to ask a question, but Ori saved Reed. He ploughed Pickle's exoskeleton into the side of Shelley's miniature house. The metal hit the wood, siding with a thud, and Shelley sat up on the sofa. She stuck a bo a, a bookmark a bookmark in her book, clearly ready to confront her little brother. Before she could do or say anything, though, Ori backed up the uh, robotic skeleton and ran it forward again. He giggled and repeated the action, bumping the little robot into the miniature house over and over. Shelley jumped up. Hey, Ori, stop it. He's not going to hurt it, Pickle said. Let him play with it. I'm not worried about your robot, Shelley said. He's not going to hurt my house. He's going to mess up my project. Shelley started toward Ori, who giggled and darted away from her. Shelley chased Ori, but he easily stayed away uh, ahead of her. He continued to play with the remote at the same time, so the little robot kept butting at the house. Ori, you little twerp, Shelley said. I'm going to break our sibling vinculum 
if you don't cut that out. Vinculum was one of the daily words from the previous week. It meant bond. That one stuck in Reed's head because he thought, when Shelley defined the word, that he'd like a deeper vin vinculum with her. <laughs> Ori, if you ruin my project... What project? Reed asked. He didn't care. He was trying to distract himself from thoughts about Julius, who, if he was being controlled by Pickle's remote, was probably being slammed into a wall in the classroom right now. Or what if he was being slammed into something sharp, like one of Mrs. Billings' robot's arms? Could Julius get impaled? It's a project for psychology class about family dynamics, Shelley said, panting and lunging for her little brother. Seriously, Shell, it's okay, Pickle said. The robot isn't going to hurt the house. It doesn't have any sharp edges. Pickle set aside his book and scrambled out of his dad's chair. He went over to where the robot was attacking the house over and over, leaning forward and pointing at the tiny rough pieces of overlapping wood that looked like the grey shingled slight siding on the real house. He said, see, not a scratch. Shelley stopped pursuing Ori. She came back to the miniature house, knelt down and examined it. Oh, she shrugged and returned to the sofa. Okay. She picked up her book and presumably returned to medieval torture. Torture. What if Julius was being tortured right now? He had to be battered pretty badly if he'd been forced to do everything Pickle's robot was doing. Pickle sat down on the floor in front of Shelley's house. He reached out and snatched up his robot. Ori, to assist for a second. Uh, Ori shoved out his lower lip. But I wanna... He began to whine. I'm not going to take it away from you, Pickle assured his brother. I'm going to make it more fun. Pickle held up his metal skeleton, which was still whirring in an effort to respond to the remote's commands. Ori's lower lip returned to its normal position. He stopped playing with the remote and his face brightened. Yeah? What are you going to do? He came over and sat down next to Pickle. I've got something cool to show you, Pickle said. It's something else you can do with this. Pickle put down the robot. He nudged Ori. So watch this, Pickle whispered. Pickle flipped a switch on the little robot. Now try it, Pickle said to Ori. Ori grinned and pushed a button on the remote. The robot stood on its blockish head. What did you just do? Reed asked Pickle. Oh, I just turned off the joint constraints, so now my robot can go against logical joint directions too. Like yours, only on purpose. <laughs> Ori gleefully pushed buttons and toggled the joystick on the remote, and the little robot flipped off his head and turned into a metal contort it started crawling across the floor like an octopus, its joints warping into impossible pretzel-like shapes. Looking at once like it was turning itself inside out and like it was expanding and contradicting, uh, sorry, and contracting the way a beating heart did, the robot became so fluid it resembled a snake. Ori directed the robot into the entry area and it clicked and clacked over the slate as it in, uh, undulated across the floor. Reed stared at it, his throat constricting. In his head, inside of the sound of the robot's metal limbs contacting on the uh, hard floor, Reed could hear the snaps and pops of breaking bones. Julius's breaking bones. The sounds were in his head, weren't they? He was imagining it and not hearing it, right? No, of course he wasn't hearing it. How could he hear it? Pickle said the remote's range wouldn't reach much beyond the Girard's house. And even if it was happening, Reed wouldn't be able to hear it. His ears weren't superhuman. They were miles from the school. If his mind was telling him he could hear Julius's bones break, his mind was lying. Reed's fears were so stupid. He couldn't believe his mind was coming up with this stuff. It was asinine. There is no way Pickle's remote could have any impact on Julius's framework. Therefore, it was having no impact on Julius. So why did Reed feel so rotten? Why was his stomach in his throat? Why did he feel like he might throw up all over the great food he'd eaten? Did he intuitively know something? Was his intuition right and his logic wrong? Reed took a deep breath and looked at his exoskeleton. Focus, he told himself. Stop imagining all that stupid stuff. Reed leaned over his project. He tried to concentrate on his exoskeleton joints, but he couldn't. Ori was having just too much fun with Pickle's robot. 
Now that the boy could make the thing writhe all over the place, he was practically dancing with glee. Pickle returned to his dad's easy chair and picked up his book. Shelley was still lost in their own reading. Ori started making the robot assault Shelley's house again. Shelley glanced up, but apparently comforted by Pickle's assurances, she placidly returned to her book. Reed scrambled off the floor. He'd had enough. I'll be back, he said. I have to do something. Ori ignored him, continuing to aim the robot at the side of Shelley's house. Pickle looked up from his book. Where are you going? I have to do something, Reed repeated. What? Pickle asked. What could Reed say? He couldn't say, I just have to go to the school and free Julius, even though that was exactly what he had to do. He had to run the three blocks to his house, get his bike and pedal back to the school. Then he had to get in the locked school without setting off an alarm. Thankfully, he'd overheard a senior talking about a basement door that wasn't wired into the school's security system and a key ring the janitor kept in a fake rock. Then he had to go through the darkened school without wetting his pants like a scared little kid. And then he had to unlock Julius and run for his life. No, wait, should he check on Julius before running? What if his worst fears were true? If Julius was badly injured, wouldn't Reed have to call an ambulance? He almost groaned out loud, but he stopped himself. And what if Julius was dead? Reed? Reed blinked when he realised Pickle had said his name. What? He said. You said you had to do something. Pickle reminded him. I asked what you had to do. Then your brain took a vacation and you turned into a weird statue. Statue? Reed was stalling. He tried to think of a reasonable story. What could he have to do right now, other than go save Julius from a modern day version of the wheel? Shelley? Pickle said. I think something's wrong with Reed. Shelley looked up from her book. Of course something's wrong with Reed, she said. He doesn't engage in enough intellection, and he lacks the appropriate night... Ni <laughs> oh, God. Shelly, why would you have to do me dirty like this? The appropriate nicest nieces when it comes to schoolwork. Oh snap, Reed thought. Even in his agitated state, he recognised that Shelly had just used two words of the day. However, he was far too distracted to care about what they meant. I'm not talking about Reed's commonplace imperfections, Pickle said. I'm referring to the fact that he's currently making no sense and his body keeps forgetting how to remain animated. Well, see, that's what I like about Reed, Shelley said. Reed perked up, momentarily forgetting everything, but finding out that Shelley liked about him. What's that? Pickle asked. Reed was relieved. He didn't have to be the one who asked. He rarely makes sense. I like that. It gives me a challenge and keeps me interested. Reed couldn't stop himself. He grinned like a maniac. Thankfully, no one was looking at him. Pickle and Shelley were looking at each other. Ori's gaze was on the little robot, whose metal limbs were now so distorted they looked elastic. I can see your point, Pickle said to Shelley, but my original question remains. Pickle returned his attention to Reed. What do you have to do? Before Reed could come up with something lame, the little robot hit the side of the miniature house again, and when it did, something large hit the outside of the Gerard's house. Shelley looked at the French doors, then put her attention back on her book. Wind must have come up. We probably lost another branch, of the big fir tree, Pickle said. Reed looked at the window. In the short time since Mrs. Gerard had left, night had slipped in around the house. Now blackness clung to the windows like a fungus. Reed couldn't see anything in the framed glass of the French doors except the reflection of the room he was in. In that reflection, he watched Ori aim the robot at the house again. He watched it hit the miniature house. In the same instant, something hit the side of the house again with a reverberating thump. Reed tensed. He looked at his friends. Neither Pickle nor Shelley reacted to the latest sound. They were apparently satisfied with the wind and fallen branch explanation for the second thump, or since they were reading again, they may not have even heard it. Well, Reed heard it, and the wind explanation didn't cut it. He was listening intently now, and even though he'd heard those impacts against the house, what he didn't hear was wind strong enough to blow out branch at the house that could make noise. He should have been hearing a whistling, whooshing sound if the wind was blowing that hard, and except for the continued crackle in the fireplace and the sound of the robot hitting Shelley's little house, the only other little things Reed could hear were the impacts on the side of the house every time the robotic skeleton hit the model house. What if Julius was out there? What if he truly 
had been manipulated by Pickle's remote um, all this time. By now, what condition would Julius be in? What Reed lacked in intellection, he made up for it in imagination. He could easily envision a body covered in swelling, blackened contusions. He could see limbs as limp, as rubber with bone fragments poking through the skin. He could see a battered face, a bleeding skull, and a spine warped into something sickeningly abnormal. If in his endoskeleton Julius had been spun, then bashed into things over and over, and if he'd been twisted and contorted the way Pickle's robot had been, would Julius even be human anymore? He'd be a mutilated mess of broken bones and torn flesh. What was it Shelley's history book had said about the victims of the wheel? A victim of the wheel ended up looking like a moaning monster with bloody tentacles. Yep, that's what Julius would have become if everything Ori had done to Pickle's robot had also been done to Julius's ex exoskeleton. Ori rammed the churning robot into the side of the miniature house again. And again, outside, something hit the real house with similar force. Reed couldn't believe Shelley and her brothers were ignoring the sounds. How could they not hear them? You never said wh where you're going, Pickle said. Another robot impact on the model house, another wimp outside. Pickle didn't mention the mimicking sound. Reed's legs gave out and he dropped to the ground. He wasn't so eager to go outside anymore, no. He now wanted more than anything to stay inside, maybe forever. He looked around. Were all the windows and doors locked? What if they weren't? No, of course they were. Mrs. Gerard wouldn't forget to lock up. She was as fanatical about safety as she was about keeping her children well fed. Reed? Reed looked at Pickle. Oh, I forgot what I was thinking of. You forgot you what you you forgot you wanted to leave a few seconds ago, Pickle asked. Reed nodded. I think I ate too much. My brain is drowning in buffalo sauce. Pickle came up with a partial smile. Mum does make great chicken wings. He leaned forward. Hey, I wonder if there are more. Or more of those popper things. He looked at his sister. Hey, Shell, do you know if Mum put away any extra chicken wings or those popper things? Shelly looked up from her book. Huh? Chicken wings? Poppers? Oh, no, they're all gone, Shelly said. And you can't be hungry already. How is it fair you get to eat so much and stay so skinny? My life would be paradisiacal <laughs> if I could eat like you with no consequences. Like paradise, we thought, in spite of himself. Ori had stopped ploughing the robot into the miniature house. Now he was circling the robot around the house at a dizzying speed. I can't help it if I'm hungry, Pickle told his sister. Well, you can't be hungry. Maybe you're just thirsty. I want a soda, Ori cried out. It was the first thing he'd said since he returned to playing with Pickle's robot. Hey, that sounds good, Pickle said. We don't have any, Shelley said. Why? Pickle asked. Remember? Mum read some article about the combination of carbonation and sugar. She discovered that our bodies process the mixture as if, as if it was poison in the system. Right, I do remember that, Pickle sighed. We shouldn't let her read. All she seems to read are things that make our lives suck. Read, who by now who had wound ah, read who by now had wound himself tighter than Pickle's grasp of basic math blurted, "Your lives don't suck." Pickle, with an open mouth, turned to look at Reed. Sorry, Reed said. Sorry. Pickle said nothing, but Shelley put down her book and looked at Reed with one eyebrow raised. Reed shrugged. It's just that you're so lucky to live in this nice house and have a mother who always makes good food for you and loves you, and he stopped because he felt like he was going to cry, and he did not want to do that. It was distress. He was making himself crazy with his panic. The little robot started climbing up the side of Shelley's miniature house. It looked like he it looked like it had somehow grown suction cups on its legs. It scaled the side of the toy house as if it was a spider. For a moment, Reed was mesmerized by the fun by the robot's functionality, and then he realized he was hearing something outside the Gerard's house. Something new, something majorly disturbing. Something was crawling up the outside wall of the family room. No, that couldn't be, could it? Reed tried to block out the sound of the little robot's clicks and drone. He listened hard beyond that. Wasn't that distant shuffling around something on the house? Yes, there. He could hear a sort of scrabbling, similar to what it sounded like when he once saw a raccoon climb up the side of his own house. Maybe it was a raccoon out there now. 
Maybe he was literally going insane and he was imagining all of this. He had to be going insane. What was he, what, uh, what he was hearing wasn't possible. But then why would he suddenly be going loopy? Was it guilt? Was he such an unadulterated wuss that the second he did something a little gutsy, his brain lost its grip on reality? Was he just going crazy because he locked Julius into the exoskeleton? You're right, Pickle said. Reed almost jumped out of his skin. What? Pickle cocked his head at Reed's peculiar behaviour. I said you're right. We are lucky. It was illogical of me to have allowed that to escape my awareness. Perhaps my blood sugar is low. If I have a soda, we don't have any, Shelley repeated. I want a soda, Ori said again. He must not have wanted one so badly because he was still playing with the robotic skeleton. He'd gotten it to climb up to the second floor of the small house. Reed jumped up and headed towards the stairs. Where are you going? Pickles a Pickle asked. Reed stopped. Good question. He didn't normally wander around the Gerard's house as if, as if he lived there. He'd been upstairs, of course, to both of the twins' bedrooms and even in Ori's bedroom. But he'd only been in the rooms when they were in the rooms. What reason did he have to go upstairs now? What reason, besides his uncontrollable need to know if something was clutching onto the exterior walls of the house by the second floor windows? Uh, sorry, I just thought of a book I needed to borrow. I was going to get it. I should have asked first. Pickles studied Reed for a few seconds, and then he shrugged. Sure, go ahead. You don't need to ask your family. This, for some reason, made Reed choke and cough, as if the words created an emotional hairball in his throat. But he knew it wasn't the words that were choking him. It was his guilt. No one in the Gerard family would have done what he did to Julius, even if Julius was still um, just locked into his metal skeleton in the robotics classroom. They sure wouldn't have let Julius get tortured, possibly to death, by Pickle's remote. The second they even had an inkling that it might be happening, they would have gone to check. What Reed lacked was initiative, motivation, impetus. <laughs> Aha! Nisus! and of effort to attain a goal. What? Um, Reed shook his head. His brain was weird. Yep, definitely. Uh, here he was in a total freak out because he was pretty sure he'd tortured someone who was now climbing up the outside of the Gerard's house in a giant robotic exoskeleton, and his brain was defining words of the day. Maybe if Reed had more nicest this evening, he would have saved Julius before Julius started crawling up the side of the house. Stop it, Reed screamed in his head. Julius is not on the side of the house. Oh, how Reed hoped he was out of his mind. He had a very, very, very bad feeling, though, that he was the same as anyone. For some reason, he'd just become clairvoyant. Or was it omniscient? Or maybe it was just observant and sensory aware. Because he could still hear something that was definitely not tree limbs crawling against the house. Reed realised that Pickle had given him permission to go upstairs and Reed was still standing here. What was wrong with him? He shook himself and strode to the stairs. Then he ran up the stairs, two at a time. On the landing, Reed stopped and looked around. Now that he was here, what was he going to do? If he looked out a window and actually saw what he was afraid he'd see, what was he going to do about it? How could he get rid of Julius and his exosuit without his friends knowing? Heck, for that matter... How could he get rid of Julius, period? Reed looked up and down the hall in complete indecision. What now? Shelley's tidy white and green room was to the right. Shelley loved white and green, the colours of purity and life, she once told Reed. Pickle's cluttered, black-walled room was to the left. Ori's race car motif bedroom was across from Pickle's room. A small, pale, yellow half-bath was straight ahead of Reed. The light suddenly shined through a window in the bathroom from outside. Reed gulped. He remembered that the Gerards had motiva uh, motivation. What? <laughs> had motion sensor lights in the backyard. One of them had just come on. Reed stared at the window intently, but he nothing happened, except for the light. He didn't see anything. Nothing appeared in the window. No shadows. No movement. He couldn't hear anything moving anymore either. He strained to listen. Nothing. Remembering he was supposed to be up here looking for a book. He figured he should head to Pickle's room and find something that he could come up with, um, some plausible explanation for wanting. He ignored the prickly sensation on the back of his neck as he took a step in the dark hallway. Images of Julius's bloody, maimed body jumped into the forefront of Reed's mind, and he had to swallow down a scream. It's just my out-of-control imagination, he thought. 
Flipping a switch just inside the doorway of Pickle's room, Reed gratefully left the dark hall and entered his friend's domain. Stuffed with books, CDs and scientific equipment, Pickle's room more resembled a laboratory than a bedroom. Only the twin bed with its constellations bedspread suggested the room belonged to a boy just into his teens. The rest of the space screamed genius. Reed crossed to Pickle's wall of wall-to-wall bookshelf. He went to the section where he knew Pickle kept fiction. Pickle read more non-fiction than fiction, but he did have a selection of sci-fi books he claimed were educational as many of, of his science books. Reed plucked one of the books from the shelf without looking at it. After he had the book, he stepped over to the window and looked out past Pickle's grey curtains. Unfortunately, the light in the room gave him a view of little more than his own reflection. He hadn't thought that though, obviously. Uh, he hadn't thought that through, obviously. You don't try to see outside at night from a well-lit room. But even with the reflection of the room in the way, Reed could see enough to tell that nothing was outside the, rin the window. Clutching the book he'd taken from the shelf, he turned toward the door. He spotted bloody tissues on Pickle's nightstand. Pickle's nose. Reed was supposed to remind him to ice his nose. He'd do that when he went back downstairs. If he got to go back downstairs. What if Julius, in his probably ruined state, was lurking outside one of the windows up here, just waiting for Reed to appear so he could crash through the glass and get revenge? Why was Reed even up here? He should have been hiding far away from where he thought Julius and his exoskeleton was. Who went, to, who went toward danger instead of away from it? Someone who wasn't 100% sure the danger was real. Reed had to know whether his thoughts were right or crazy. He made himself return to the hallway so he, conti he could continue his search for whatever was or wasn't out there. It was still dark throughout the upstairs and it was still silent. Reed crept across the hall into Ori's bedroom. At the threshold, he tripped over something and caught himself by the door jamb. His heart rate sped up. He'd heard a metallic clink when his foot made contact with whatever it was. What if it was an exoskeleton? He quickly turned on the light, almost afraid to see what was on the floor. It was just a toy fire, fire truck. Reed exhaled. He looked around Ori's chaotic mess. He couldn't remember seeing so many toy cars in one place, not even in a toy store. Ori had one of those rugs with a racetrack on it. Toy cars were scattered all over the track, and beyond the racetrack rug onto the wall-to-wall -wall carpet too. Nothing unusual here. A bright red shade with a cartoon race car on it pulled over, or was pulled over Ori's single window. Reed couldn't bring himself to open that shade to look outside. As he flipped the light switch and stood once again in the hall, it occurred to Reed that turning on lights hadn't been that smart. Not only did it did the interior lights impair his night vision, but the lights telegraphed where he was. If something was outside, it could be hiding when he turned on the lights. Well, that was just dumb. Why would Julius be hiding if it was Julius outside, if anything was outside? Reed wasn't sure at this point that either possibility would bring him relief. Either there was a broken and gory monster clinging onto the side of the house, or Reed was just having a complete mental breakdown. Either way, he couldn't just stand here forever. Reed? Shelley called from the bottom of the stairs. Reed froze as if he'd been caught reading her diary or something. Yeah? His voice broke. We're going down to the corner to get sodas. Do you want to come with? No, that's okay. You go ahead. I'll stay here if that's alright with you. Sure, just don't go in Ori's room. You'll probably break a foot on one of his cars. I'm pretty sure he has some kind of vehicle assembly line in his room. Shelley snorted when Ori protested in the background. I do not. Wait, what's an assembly line? Reed smiled. For a second he felt almost normal as he listened to Pickle, Shelley and Ori head to the door. Oh, Reed, Pickle called again. Reed went vigid again. He cleared his throat. What? Don't tell mum where we went if she comes home early. Pickle yelled up the stairs. You're an idiot, Shelley told her brother. You think he doesn't know everything we do? She does? Or you asked in an awed tone. Everything. Everything, Shelley said empathetically as the door... Oh, sorry, emphatically. Sorry. <laughs> That's a new word. Shelley said emphatically as the front door opened. Reed listened to the stomps and shuffles of his friends leaving the house. The door slammed. He waited. He heard the lock slide into place and he said a silent thank you for the way Shelley had adopted her mother's safety con consciousness. At the same time, he became ultra aware that he was completely 100% alone in the Gerard's house. 
If what he thought was outside was indeed outside, this could be bad for him. Really bad. What if Julius had been waiting for an opportunity just like this? But why? Why would Julius wait if he, ha if he was a lacerated monster? Wouldn't he just want to kill anything in sight? Wait, now Reed's brain was really getting way out there. Just because Julius might have been mangled by the exoskeleton Reed had locked him into, and Ori had inadvertently made it do things that tortured Julius with mind-crumbling pain didn't mean Julius had suddenly turned into a killer. He was still just a kid, maybe a horrible kid, and maybe now even a badly injured kid, but just a kid. But was he just a kid? Not really. Julius was a really mean kid. Reed would never forget the day Julius first showed up in his school in third grade. He wouldn't forget it because that's when his own torture started. Julius had been tormenting Reed for six years. Julius seemed to thrive on humiliating other kids and he seemed to get downright euphoric when he hurt them. For all Reed knew, Julius had, uh, was already a killer. At the very least, he'd probably been murdering and dissecting squirrels for years. So if Julius was now in unspeakable pain because of what Reed did, it made sense that he'd been even more homicidal now. Reed didn't know for sure, but he figured agony brought out the worst in a person. The house creaked, and Reed leaped out of his pointless thoughts, uh, thoughts, <laughs> thoughts and back into the dark hall. That sound was just the house creaking, wasn't it? He listened for several minutes. When he didn't hear anything else, he crept down the hall to Shelley's room. He knew he wouldn't step on anything in here. She was obsessed with order. Going slowly, he felt his way through her room until he reached her, her window, which he knew overlooked the front of the house. Standing back from the edge of the window, he lifted the edge of her heavy green curtains and peeked outside. Nothing was out there that shouldn't have been. Below the window, the porch roof stretched along the, the front of the house. By the street, the mailbox leaned a little to the left. Two large... Two large trees... <laughs> Stre I, I, sorry, I, I don't know how to say that either. I should probably look that up someday. I'm probably being really dumb. Two large trees. I don't want, because I don't want to say cheddar. <laughs> like, and cedar? Ch cedar? I don't know. You guys are going to have to tell me. <laughs> I'm very dumb. Two large trees stretched their branches towards Shelley's window. One of the branches brushed against the side of the house. Although, as Reed had thought, it wasn't windy. There was a slight breeze and the branch moved against the siding. Was this the sound Reed had heard earlier? Had he gotten himself all worked up for nothing? He hoped so, but he didn't think he was worried about nothing. Scanning the night, he searched for any sign of movement. He saw none. Stepping away from the window, Reed picked his way out of Shelley's room. In the hallway, he hesitated. Should he go into Mr. and Mrs. Gerard's room? He looked around. As long as he didn't touch anything, why not? It wasn't like he was going to turn on the light and snoop around. He just wanted to look out their big window, which overlooked the backyard. Reed crossed the hall and stepped into the master bedroom. A nightlight near the master bath cast a dim glow throughout the room. It created creepy shadows, but at least it made manoeuvring to the window easy. All he had to do was swivel a rocking chair away from the window and nudge aside the curtain. Then he was able to see nothing unusual. Again, the yard looked like it the way it should. All was quiet. Enough of this! Reed dropped the curtain and strode from the room. He looked over the hall, then ran down the steps and returned to the family home. Uh, room, sorry. The family room looked the way it had when he'd left it, minus the Gerard siblings. Apparently, Pickle had put a small log on the fire after Reed went upstairs because the fire was flaring up behind the metal screen that protected the room from stray sparks. Pickle's book was on the end of the table next to his dad's easy chair. Shelley's book was lying on the sofa. Reed sank into the uh, cushy, yeah, cushy carpet. He looked around. Where was the little robot? He didn't see it. Did Ori take it with him? Reed spotted the remote on the floor next to the sofa, but the robot wasn't in sight. Maybe Ori got it stuck under a piece of furniture. Reed turned and looked at Shelley's miniature house. It really was an amazing thing. It seemed to be accurate in every little detail. All the furniture he could see on the front porch and inside of the house through the open doors was exactly like the real furniture in the normal-sized house. What about the art and stuff? He wondered. He scooted over to examine the house more closely. As, as he figured she would have, Shelley had re recreated all the art and knickknacks inside the house. 
Anything in this real house was in the toy house. She'd even put pencil marks with dates on the wall just inside the kitchen doorway. The marks and dates that chronicled the Gerard kid's growth over the years. And outside, one of the downsp uh, downspouts was bent, just like the real one out to the front was. It got bent when Reed and Pickle were trying to learn how to throw a football. One of their errant tosses, though forceful, went badly askew and left a permanent indentation in the metal. Reed shifted again so he could look at the, mini the miniature version of the room he sat in. Wow, he breathed. There was a super miniature house inside the super miniature house. Talk about realism. It shouldn't have surprised him that Shelley was that thorough with her model house. Shelley never did anything halfway, and if she couldn't do it well, she stopped doing it. Reed remembered finger painting was pickle in Shelley in kindergarten. The, che the teacher had been wandering around telling everyone they were doing great, but when she got to Shelley, she didn't say anything. Aren't I doing great too? Shelley asked. Of course, kiddo, the teacher said. You're lying, Shelley accused. I can tell by the tone of your voice. She stood up and put her hands on her hips, careful to avoid getting paint on her red pants. Reed remembered watching the teacher think it o over. She finally decided on the truth. Well, you aren't really getting to the point of finger you aren't really getting the point of finger painting. It's to be free with the colour and have fun. You're trying too hard, making everything too perfect. Fine, Shelley said. She reached up, grabbed her paper and marched over to put her finger painting in the trash. Reed grinned at the memory. Then he saw something silver and shiny glinting through the window at the back of the mini mo model house's room. He leaned forward and canted his head so he could see behind the mini model house. <laughs> That's where the little robot went. It was inside the miniature house, behind the mini miniature house. Reed started to reach into the miniature house to rescue the robot. Before he could get a hand in through the front door though, the little robotic skeleton raised up off the floor of the house. Reed jumped, then started to shake his head at his, at his edginess. <laughs> and that's when Julius sprang up from behind the model house. Reed scrambled backward, screaming. In his mind, he called what he was seeing Julius because his vivid imagination had prepared him to see the boy he, the way he looked now. But Julius didn't look a thing like Julius. He was, in fact, exactly what Reed's mind had known Julius would be. Now nothing more than a fleshy octopus-like mass of pulpy limbs attached to a metal frame. Julius can no longer be called a boy. He wasn't, he couldn't be called human. Reed wasn't even sure Julius was alive. Yes, Julius moved, but Reed didn't know if that was Julius initiating the movement or if his corpse was being controlled by the metal framework latched onto Julius like a loathsome external parasite. Julius's face was slack, so there was no life there. It was slack because it looked like the bone structure of his forehead, cheeks and jaw had been pulverised. His features were so distorted, he resembled some kind of crudely sewn cloth version of himself. No longer framed by wavy blonde hair because that hair was now sticky and stringy with congealed blood, Julius's face was like a repulsive doll's face, a doll much worse than Alexa's baby doll with the staring black eyes. Julius's eyes were a thousand times more disconcerting than empty black ones. His eyes had rolled back in his head, so all that he was showing was the whites, the murky cloudy whites. Those ghosty, ghostly whites made him look like a sightless zombie. But like a zombie, Julius, alive or not, was moving. He was moving determinately, um, determinedly, sorry, toward Reed. Reed willed his legs to work, and he struggled to find his feet. Looking wildly around the room, he decided to decide, he'd try to decide on the best escape route. The windows? They had a complicated latching system. He wouldn't be able to get them open in time. The doors? Duh. Reed ran toward the French doors. He knew they had a special lock, the kind that required keys on the outside or the inside, but the key was kept near the door, wasn't it? He scanned the area near the door. No key. He realised he had no idea whether Gerard's kept the key and he had no time to look for it. Turning, Reed ran toward the entryway. The Julius thing scuttled out from behind the miniature house and tumbled across the floor after him. Reed tore through the archway, rounding the corner and heading to the front door. Before he could get there though, Julius sprang to the ceiling and skittered past Reed to block his way to the front door. Reed didn't pause to consider his options, he just raced up the stairs. Glancing over his shoulder, Reed watched in horror as Julius and his metal frame flailed, crushed limbs grotesquely to catapult from the entry ceiling to the stairway wall. 
The Julius thing scaled the stairway wall as Reed ran. Reed was barely able to stay ahead of his persper. Well, persper? Pursuer. <laughs> oh, I keep messing up. And it's annoying me. I'm sure it's annoying you too, I'm very sorry. At the landing, Reed got a glimpse of Julius leaping to the ceiling again. Reed turned, aiming for Pickle's room. His plan, if he could call it that, was to use Pickle's scientific equipment as weapons to keep Julius at bay while Reed escaped out of Pickle's front-facing window. Like Shelley's, it was all over the front porch roof, so Reed wouldn't have to drop two stories to the ground. Although at this point, he'd have dropped multiple stories if it meant getting away from Julius, or whatever, or what was left of him. Feeling something at the same time rubbery and sharp nick his shoulder as he tore into Pickle's room. Reed managed to get the light on as he entered. He grabbed the first piece of equipment he saw, a big and heavy microscope, almost too big and heavy for him to lift, but he managed. Once he had the microscope in his firm grip, Reed turned and swung blindly out in front of him. He was sure he'd connect with Julius because Julius was right on his heels, but Julius wasn't there. Reed looked around desperately. Where did Julius go? Reed looked up. The Julius abomination dropped off the ceiling and landed on Reed before Reed could swing the microscope again. The impact knocked the microscope from Reed's hand. It tumbled across the room as Reed screamed and tried to squirm out from under the horrendous combination of hard and sharp metal and squishy, clammy, destroyed body parts. At the same time, he tried to hold his breath because the, the Julius thing smelled dreadful. It smelled like blood, putrid flesh and stale sweat. It was dripping on Reed too. Julius's flesh and his no longer stylish clothing, perforated by puncture wounds caused by jutting cracked bones, was smeared with dried blood, uh, and his body was seeped flesh blood too. Galvanised by his revulsion, Reed struck out at, at the metal and flesh that attempted to engulf him. He fought with all the strength he had and some he'd obviously gotten from someplace else. At first, Reed thought he was going to be able to get away. Julius's hands didn't work right and they couldn't grip Reed firmly. Reed managed to slither out from under Julius and he stood, preparing to race around the bed to escape out the window. But what Julius lacked in coordination and grip, he made up for in speed. Reed made it halfway to the window, but then caught something caught his foot. No, not something. Julius saw his frame or both. Reed looked back at the combination of metal and tissue that coiled around his ankle. Let me go, Reed yelled. Why did he waste his breath? Did he really think a shouted command would stop whatever Julius had become? It wouldn't have stopped human Julius. It sure wasn't going to stop his this version of Julius. Reed kicked out and his foot slipped away just a little. But then Julius clamped down harder. How? How was Julius going to be, uh, how was Julius able to grip anything without working bones? It didn't matter. Reed was just distracting himself with all these irrelevant thoughts. He was trying to put off the inevitable. Reed wasn't going to get away from Julius, not even if he made it to the window. Julius was now powered by a robotic framework a mere human couldn't defeat, especially if that mere human was Reed. Plus, Julius now seemed to be supercharged by the monstrosity that he'd become, and that monstrosity had been born of the kind of emotions that propelled humans past their usual limitations. Emotions like pain and fear. Emotions like rage. Julius's rage was more powerful than Reed's guilt. Reed didn't stand a chance, but still he tried, kicking his feet as if power swimming against the tide. Reed army crawled across the rug. He willed himself away from what held on to him. He imagined himself going through Pickle's window and jumping to freedom. Reed let out a banshee-like cry and yanked his foot from Julius's grasp. He staggered to his feet and turned toward the window. Before Reed could take a step though, Julius was on him again. This time, Julius fell fully onto Reed and they both went down on Pickle's bed. Oi oi. <laughs> Reed was pinned under Julius's hideous remains and the metal frame strapped to them. Reed inhaled Julius's stench and gagged. Even as he gagged, he cried out, help. Whose help was he calling for? No one else was in the house. Would the neighbors hear? Reed's face was just inches from Julius's lifeless eyes and sagging mouth. Gagging again and whimpering, Reed turned his face away from the horror above him. He shut his eyes as if he could make his macabre or... Mas ma oh, I can never say that word. Masab no, it is macabre, right? His macabre attacker disappeared by pretending it wasn't there. His heart pounding so loud he could hear little else. Reed bucked. 
and lurched, trying to free himself from the thing. But he wasn't strong enough, even though Julius didn't seem to be gripping Reed in any way. His weight alone, along with the, all that of all the metal framework, was enough to pin Reed in place. Reed was trapped. Practically hyperventilating in shock and fright, Reed forced himself to open his eyes and look at Julius. When he did, he was sorry. He immediately closed his eyes again. He couldn't stand looking at the milky white, irisless eyes staring down at him. Or were they staring? Or, uh, yeah. <laughs> Reed didn't know if Julius was conscious. How could he be with his bones crushed into smithereens? It was more likely Julius was dead and the movement of the thing was he was strapped into was caused by some kind of short in the system. Maybe the interference of Pickle's remote had so badly fried the exoskeleton systems that it was wildly fun functioning on its own now. Something dripped into Reed's face. He had to open his eyes. It was worth not knowing what was happening above him. Reed opened his eyes. Okay, maybe not knowing wasn't worse. Blood was pooling in the spongy mass of what used to be Julius's face. It looked like a misshapen sponge that had been used to clean up a massacre. And now it was dripping its warm, wet contents or contents uh, onto Reed's cheeks. The previously cream-coloured scarf looped around Julius's neck was saturated, too. It, hung, it hung down toward Reed like a dead animal in a slaughterhouse, mesmerised by now how of the whites... Sorry. <laughs> mesmerised now by the whites of Julius's eyes bulging out from between long blonde lashes, Reed couldn't turn away from the malformed thing above him. But he, was st but he still struggled. Grunting, he shoved upward with all his might. It did no good. It was like the weight of a hundred cars pinned him down. Please, please, Reed whispered. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I didn't know this was going to happen to you. I just wanted you to be locked in overnight. I didn't want this to happen. He knew there was no use in begging, but he couldn't help himself. He opened his mouth to say something else, but that's when the question of whether Julius had consciousness was answered. Julius shifted downward to press his heavy, seeping mass against Reed's mouth. Reed could no longer speak, but he could hear. In the distance, downstairs, the other kids were returning from their soda run. Reed could hear Pickle suggesting to Shelley that he could construct a better torture device than anything medieval people had come up with. I'm not sure that would be an accomplishment, Pickle, Shelley said. Reed strained, grunting, desperate to get their attention. Trying to yell, Reed could only make out unintelligible groans. Downstairs, Ori piped up. Can I play with the remote again, Pickle? Julia shifted and Reed allowed himself a moment of hope. Maybe he could get away. Pouring every bit of life force he had into his muscles, he surged upwards. He hoped to erupt like a volcano and get ejected away from Julius toward freedom, but he didn't erupt, or rather he did. But before he could get ejected away from the Julius cage that imprisoned him, Julius's mashes, ma uh, mashed hands somehow grabbed hold of Reed's outstretched hands. Julius's formless legs somehow managed to wrap tightly around Reed's ankles. Reed was now as linked to Julius as Julius was to his exoskeleton, and Reed knew what, he, uh, what was going to happen next. With the pressure of Julius's face wedged against Reed's throat, Reed couldn't make a sound that could be heard downstairs. He was facing his worst nightmare, and he couldn't scream. Downstairs, Pickle responded to his brother's question. Sure, Ori, go nuts. We have all night. Ori grinned and knelt on the floor next to the miniature house. Usually interested only in cars and racing, Ori was surprised by how much fun this robot was. Maybe he could get his brother to build him other things. He'd never been able to get a robot to move this way before. It was super cool. Pressing a button, Ori got the, the little robot to crawl out from behind the miniature house, or the mini miniature house. He carefully maneuvered the robot out of the miniature house, not wanting to get on his sister's bad side. One time, he ran the little skeleton into a wall. When he did, he heard something bump on the floor above his head. He looked up, but he didn't hear anything else, so he continued carefully guiding the robot out of the house and onto the miniature porch. When he got out, when he got it out, he did a little fist bump. Happy with himself, Ori grinned wider and decided to see if he could get the robot to do even weirder things than it was doing before he got his soda. He began manipulating the remote so fast his fingers were just a big blur. In response, the little robot shot off the toy ha ha house's porch and began spinning and thrashing. While Ori shouted in triumph, the little robotic skeleton began popping and snapping its metal limbs in all kinds of unnaturally delightful ways. 
Huh. That's that's the end. That is the end of the breaking room. <laughs> uh I didn't enjoy that. Genuinely. I don't know I don't know why I didn't enjoy it. I just didn't really enjoy it. I think I wish I I think hmm. I have a I have quite a few criticisms about that. First of all, all of the characters were introduced at once at the beginning. So it took me a good like it took me like literally half the book to understand who is who and how they're all related and stuff. Um so that that is that is one thing. Um another thing is this literally had nothing to do with the breaking wheel. It was literally just mentioned once and then like and uh, it was a completely different story. Also I don't really understand it. Um I think I mean again I'm very dumb and I'll have to read through this all again one time. But um I believe the small house I don't want to say to him. I don't want to say all of that because it might be completely wrong and then I'm just going to look like a, a flipping idiot. Um I, I tell you, while I read these, like, sometimes I zone out, so I, I miss a few bits of information, but that's just, that's just me, so please forgive me, but the the house obviously has something to do with it, right, like, the miniature house is, like, I don't know, like, all of it is controlled by the miniature, I don't know, I don't know. What I do know, though, is that the next story is He Told Me Everything, uh, and apparently, apparently, it's a good one. So, um, I, I, I had high hopes for this one, and unfortunately, I didn't enjoy the story as much as I feel like I could have. Um, but I feel like he told me everything is going to be a really good one again. <laughs> so, let's hope for that. Um, that will be coming out very soon, and yeah, I will see you then. So, goodbye. <laughs>